Good evening, everybody, to our weekly University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposium. Always a pleasure. Uh, I look forward always to this part of the week. So uh, again, this is our number 25, 25th session today on November 5. Uh, Jacques Morcos, uh, I'm professor and co-chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and uh, secondary appointment in ENT. I'm director of cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery at the University of Miami. Uh, it is always my pleasure to have the co-directors of this course, Carolina Benjamin, my partner, assistant professor, directors of our Keynes Dissection Lab, and uh, Carolina specializes in brain tumor and skull-based surgery, Mike Ivan, Assistant Professor, Director of Research at the UM Brain Tumor Initiative, and Mike specializes in brain tumors, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular, open vascular colleagues, uh, Robert Stark and Eric Peterson, uh, who run our endovascular uh, program. This is uh, beautiful Miami, and the two main hospitals we work at are University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital. Naturally, we're a tertiary, tertiary referral center for not only cerebrovascular and skull base, but many other uh, conditions. Housekeeping instructions. Audience members, please use the Q&A box. Uh, to send your questions throughout the session and we will address them all at the end in our uh, 20 minutes or so of discussion time at the end. We don't offer CMEs but you can get an email confirmation that you've attended this. Uh, please uh, let uh, your colleagues on social media know if you like our weekly educational offerings and let them know about it. Our two speakers today, like every week, will have 25 minutes each. I might give them a two or a three minute warning before the end to make sure we have time for our panelists and for you, the audience. So we've, of course, done this like many times already. We are down here, number 25, and uh, I will show you what's coming in the coming few weeks. But next week uh, is actually by popular demand from you, the audience who have emailed me, you wanted sessions on complications, which uh, I completely agree is, is, is some of the most educational sessions I've sat through uh, as a resident and later is listening to talks on complications. So next week is the first of four sessions it will be complications in cerebrovascular surgery. And you can see our five speakers. It will be a different format next week. We'll have five speakers, 20 minutes each. Aaron cohen Gadol, Greg Thompson, Siviero Agazi, Paul Camarata, and David Langer tackling each part of cerebrovascular surgery, a different top, subtopic, as you can see. Uh, as you know, Mike Ivan, my partner, has also been directing a wonderful Wednesday weekly session, the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. And next week, uh, our guest is uh, John Golfinos, the chair at NYU, a vast experience in the treatment of neurofibromatosis type 2. Very good friend of mine. I'm looking forward to listening to him next Wednesday. So please join us. And now for the first time too, this is now our third educational offering from our department. We are going to start a weekly, when I say we, it's not me, but my colleagues, Toba Niazi and Heather McRae, pediatric neurosurgeons, will start a weekly seminar on Mondays. So if you are interested in pediatric neurosurgery, please join every Monday. Uh, the co-directors of the course are our other two pediatric neurosurgical partners, John Ragib, Shelley Wang. Uh, and this is their inaugural session this coming Monday, November 9, from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And it's on the evolving landscape of pediatric neurosurgical oncology. So again, if you have an interest in pediatric, every Monday will be a session similar to what we're doing here today or what we're doing on Wednesdays. Um, 
thank you to the team that is behind uh, the the screen here ingrid roberto cristina and particularly ignacio uh, escalona who, who runs this webinar this is the link to watch previously recorded sessions we have a bunch of them by now as you know this is our website and this takes you to then to the youtube channel with all the previously recorded sessions feel free to email me i'm also on twitter if you need any more information we have a departmental instagram departmental twitter uh, ingrid has uh, in menendez who runs our educational program has that's her email there uh, so on to the panelists today great pleasure to welcome all three of them first mike chicoin who i've known for many years now mike is a professor and uh, of the department of neurosurgery at washington university school of medicine in st louis uh, mike is a past director at large of the north american skull base society he's editor of the skull base uh, portion of operative neurosurgery and many other commitments and of course a highly accomplished skull base surgeon and a very good friend and a, from the uh, lineage of harry van loveren and others so mike it's wonderful to have you with us today next is philip theodosopoulos obviously greek in origin again a friend of many years phil and i have known each other since teaching at the ircad uh, in France, uh, uh, yearly skull base pilgrimage we've done before COVID. We, uh, both he and I miss those trips. Phil is professor and vice chair in neurosurgery and director of the skull base tumor program at UCSF in San Francisco. His residency program director has been involved in many courses nationally and internationally. And last but not least, is my colleague here from the University of Miami, from the Department of Otolaryngology, from particularly the section of Phrenology, Corina Levin, assistant professor in the department. And of course, our relationship between neurosurgery and ENT is extremely close and, of course, is a, a keystone of the skull base program. And Corina is already a rising star nationally in the North American Skull Base Society, and of course, a fantastic uh, uh, partner in the operating room, as she will, I'm sure, share one of the slides, one of the, the cases later, uh, uh, to show a little bit how we all work together. And now on to the two speakers of the night. I didn't do this on purpose, but they both happen to be Italian. They both happen to be extremely accomplished, and of course, uh, skull base and particularly endonasal and open skull base surgeons. Let me start with Fred Gentili, professor in the Department of Surgery, Division of Neurosurgery at the University Health Network, University of Toronto, Canada. He has been there since 1982, uh, founding member of the North American Skull Base Society, member of the skull base uh, committee of the world federation of neurosurgical societies has a very rare distinction of holding two academic chairs written extensively and of course this only scratches the surface i don't want to waste too much time telling you his entire cv but but fred of course has been a friend for many years and actually when i was president of the north american, american skull base society fred was one of the, my three uh, uh, honored invited guests, and of course, for good reason. Uh, on to Luigi Cavallo, again, who I've met through the IRCAD uh, uh, teaching uh, courses that Sebastian Frolic puts together in France. Luigi is Associate Professor of Neurosurgery in Napoli at the Federico School of Medicine. Uh, Luigi, of course, world renowned, particularly for his endonasal work, has done more than 1500 pituitaries, more than 500 extended endonasal approaches, written extensively, invited all over the world. Of course, Luigi is from the lineage of Paolo Capabianca, again, a giant of the field. And I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to invite Fred to unmute himself, 
share his screen and start his presentation. Here we go. So great pleasure to invite everybody to be part of this pan panel tonight. So everybody can see my screen now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Jock. And I do wanna congratulate you and the entire Miami uh, uh, group. I think you're doing an amazing job with these uh, educational symposium. I call them symposiums. Um, they're very educational. Most of my fellows uh, uh, watch these. And so again, thank you very much. It's, and I know it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Anyways, uh, my talk uh, this afternoon, uh, at least in Toronto, Poor Cavallo, it's 11 o'clock at night over there in Italy, uh, Luigi, eh? is the management of recurrent and giant pituitary adenomas. Now, there are a number of controversies in pituitary adenomas. The diagnostic controversy, as you know, since 2017, a WHO classification, and these are now, we can no longer call these adenomas, apparently my endocrine people tell me, these are now neuroendocrine tumors. Um, you know, there's the management of uh, cavernous sinus involvement, the whole issue of radiotherapy, when do you do it, the indication for craniotomy, what is the best surgical approach, uh, the management of recurrent and, and management of giant, which is really going to be the focus of my talk today. But just briefly, what is the best surgical approach? Well, I don't think, I think we're, you know, now pretty much decided that, uh, that the endoscopic approach really is the approach of choice for these, uh, for these tumors. Um, and just to show you, it's just an, an amazing different world with the endoscope. Here we are, uh, uh, the, 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 the wide panoramic view that you get is just uh, unlike anything. And I, you know, I'm old enough to have done the, the microscopic approach so I can see it. Here we are taking this adenoma. You can see the medial wall. I'm not going to bore you with these long uh, movies, but the medial wall of cavernous sinus bilaterally, the diaphragma has come down. You can see as we go down, here's the Doppler just showing us the carotid in the cavernous, uh, uh, in the cavernous sinus. So you get a very nice, nice removal in this type of uh, tumor. And this patient, as you can see, uh, postoperatively, nice resection. Uh, 13 years later, no evidence of, of uh, disease uh, progression. So I think there's no question, uh, the, you know, the endoscopic approach uh, is really the current state of the art. And I feel there's, even though, you know, people will say, well, where's the level one evidence? There really isn't, but no question in my mind that uh, pituitary surgeon that's of the future uh, has to know endoscopy and it will become the standard of care in pituitary adenomas. Now, uh, what is the, man the management of recurrent pituitary adenomas? Now, this is a patient 1990, 30 years ago, presented with a macroadenoma visual uh, complaint. And 30 years later, no evidence of recurrence, normal pituitary function. Now, we all would love to have all our patients like this, correct? Unfortunately, uh, in my experience, this is a very much an exception. What we more like get something like this, 93, 1993 microscopic transphenoidal. They had a recurrence in this, uh, uh, 1997, repeat microscopic. Then in 2007, had, a, had a, a, again, disease progression. I did an endoscopic transphenoidal. Then he had some slow growth in the cavernous sinus. We watched it, but in, in 2014, repeat endoscopic. And now 2015, uh, in, in small increase of cavernous sinus. What do you do with a case like this? Well, we'll get back to that uh, later. So recurrent adenomas, unfortunately, they're common. The incidence will vary, but up to, you know, people up to 50, 60%. The time of recurrence, very important here, is they can be very long. So you really have to follow your patients. We've seen patients 18 years out that, that subsequently have had a, uh, had a, a recurrence. The peak time recurrence, one to five years. These are difficult management problems, no question, with increased treatment morbidity, decreased uh, favorable treatment outcome. And if you're interested to look in the, in the literature, there's no real consensus on the optical management of these residual recurrent. When do you do repeat surgery? When do you do the radiation? After the first recurrence, after the second recurrence, there's nothing in the literature that helps you with this. And then, but we do know that the management often of these require a multidisciplinary approach. 
This is the recurrent rates following microsurgical treatment of tertiary adenomas from the 1960s on. With the microsurgical, you can see non-functioning uh, growth home adenomas. Our endocrinologists who follow these for many years tell me at least up to 80% of patients with acromegaly ultimately fail and, and, uh, out of remission. So the risk factors for recurrence of the adenomas, of course, incomplete tumor resection at the initial surgery. There's some issue with regard to tumor biology. Of course, infiltration of adjacent structures, particularly the cavernous sinus, is a, is a major uh, uh, issue. Uh, size, uh, uh, age, sex, and some series, these are, uh, these are shown to be uh, valid. In other series, they're not. The course, the, the importance is the experience of the surgeon. We know that from, from, from way back. And as I uh, uh, mentioned, duration of follow-up. So a two-year follow-up in a pituitary series means nothing. The treatment options, of course, are like they are for, for uh, uh, primary lesions, except we know that repeat surgery carries a higher risk for morbidity and a reduced chance of total removal. We've done over about 2,000 cases now of uh, endoscopic pituitary adenomas uh, in, in, our, in our department here. And the question was with regard to recurrences, has the endoscopic techniques improved our ability to deal with recurrent pituitary adenomas? So we looked at, uh, if you look at this patient uh, here, a 51 year old female, persistent Cushing's after previous microsurgical uh, procedure. You can see, uh, and I'll just, again, not uh, bore you with that. The issue was that the lesion was posteriorly back with a partially the, the, the type two conchal uh, uh, cella. And we drilled down part of the upper clivus that allowed us to get to this uh, nice, beautiful little Harvey, uh, um, a Jules Hardy type of uh, uh, microadenoma that you can see here. We're able to get a very nice removal. Here's the medial wall of cavernous sinus that we can take it out very nicely from the medial wall of cavernous sinus. Uh, here we are after the removal of the, of the uh, tumor. This patient uh, subsequently, as you see, had uh, normal urinary free cortisol, seven years remains in remission. We never say we can cure or at least cure a Cushing. We say we put them in remission because they will likely recur. Now, this is a 67-year-old patient with persistent acromegaly. You can see this virtually a conchal uh, sphenoid, very difficult. And this patient had a, you know, had a microsurgical approach, uh, remained uh, in, not in remission. And this is the endoscopic approach that allows us to do this. We do obviously do, drilled down the upper clivus that allowed us to finally find the uh, cellar floor that you can see here. And then ultimately we can get a nice removal. This is the medial wall of cavernous sinus. And uh, just to show you here again, and this patient is post-op five years again in remission, not a cure, we do not say cure. There's a 53 year old patient, 2017 microscopic partial resection. The problem was this, look at this, kissing carotids. And how do you deal? Well, they obviously were able to get a partial but significant residual. So the endoscopic allows us to get, a, I think a better resection. Uh, by going above basically the carotid vessels. And here very quickly to show you uh, what uh, we did, you get a nice exposure that they did not do in initially. So the carotids are here, basically here and here. So we go above the carotid, but even a partial expanded to allow us to get over. Uh, in this patient, um, uh, as you can see here, we got a, a removal, not a, not a total removal, but you can see this resection. We improved the, the patient's vision, which came back virtually to normal. So this is our series that we published uh, back in 2012 because we wanted to look at the endoscopic surgery recurrent pituitary adenomas, 39 patients. You can see here the demographics, 19 non-functioning, 20 functioning. Uh, and unfortunately, as you can see here, 43% of them already had frank cavernous eyes and vision. Uh, what we looked at at that time, we wanted to know what is it, you know, what, why it, it, could it be better? And, and the results from an anatomical point of view, we found that three quarters of the case of the sphenoidotomy was not uh, uh, wide enough, lateral and rostrocaudal, and in two thirds, the cellar opening was limited, and this restricted the working angle, uh, uh, working area and angle of view. The results? The results, yeah, we had a little problem. The gross total rates was 54% in the entire series. The gross total removal rates in non-function was 86% without cavernous sinus invasion, 0% in those with, uh, with uh, cavernous sinus invasion. I personally do not believe anyone can get a total removal of an adenoma once it's uh, 
purely infiltrated the cavernous sinus. And you know, some people disagree with that, but that's my view. In functional adenoma, Cushing 75%, again, in full remission. However, not when there was evidence of cavernous sinus invasion uh, growth, uh, growth hormone. We looked at these and compared them to the, to the uh, microscopic theory. And the overall, these were better results than in most reported series of recurrent microscopic surgery. Cavernous sinus invasion was the major predictor of outcome. This is a more recent series that we just published that, and it's just been accepted now by World Neurosurgery. It should be out very soon in October. We wanted to look at now long-term outcome because as I've told you before, the importance of following these patients long-term. We wanted long-term outcome and how, how did we manage these recurrent tumors? So this is a series, 269 patients with non-functioning. Here we did not have a functioning in our series. We wanted to look at non-functioning, the tumor characteristics, the pathologies that you can see here. So these are the results. The overall recurrence rate was 20.5%, 20, 20 22% at five years and 47, almost 50% at 10 years. The median time to recurrence was 10 years for patients without cavernous sinus involvement and six years for those with cavernous sinus involvement. Among the recurrences, 82 had had only a subtotal resection, 18% had a gross total resection and had presented with a recurrence. Among the recurrent cases, I mean, 63%, two thirds had had evidence of cavernous sinus involvement prior to surgery. Now it's interesting that a third of these were symptomatic with visual worsening, but two thirds were asymptomatic. Uh, looking at the risk factors, uh, the, under univariate analysis, size, of course, cavernous sinus invasion, anterior skull extension, residual tumor after surgery were significantly associated with recurrence under multivariate age, tumor uh, size, cavernous sinus involvement, and residual tumor were associated with recurrence. Silent corticotrophin in terms of the type uh, had seemed to have a higher tendency and all, we're all aware of the silent corticotrophin subtypes, uh, but they were interesting, were not statistically significant. So how do we manage these uh, recurrences? 52% of patients required a second surgery because of visual symptoms or to prevent visual uh, complication from growing lesions. The gross total neural rates that you can see here, only 28%, only less than, than 30%. 15 patients uh, underwent radiation. You can see nine gamma knife, two fractionated, 10 after the first recurrence and five after the second. Tumor control rates with radiation was 87% uh, percent in a mean follow-up of uh, 37 months. So back to our other patient that I began at the beginning. So this is patient two uh, microsurgical approaches, uh, two endoscopic approaches. Now uh, a recurrence in the cavernous sinus, what do you do? Well, there's no question to me, surgery is not the answer for this patient. So this patient, we recommended the radiation and this patient, as you can see uh, here is now five years with stable, uh, stable disease. So radiation is no question, it's, uh, it doesn't matter people who don't like radiation, but radiation has a significant role to play in uh, recurrent pituitary adenomas. Uh, various types of radiation have, have been used. If you look at the, uh, the literature, you can see in terms of functioning and non-functioning up to 50, 60% uh, uh, remission rates, uh, but non-functioning, you can see are up to 88% at five years uh, uh, control. This is a, a one by, by Loeffler looking at a literature review with evidence synthesis of very high success in controlling tumor rates up to 90% uh, percent, regardless of the radiation technique use or ad adenoma subtypes. There is, of course, the issue of hypopituitarism, which is unexpected results of radiation therapy, but overall, uh, overall rates of other treatment-related adverse effects were quite low. Now, the management of recurrent adenomas, also there is medical management. I don't have time to go through each to these today, we, are, we work very closely with our endocrinologists and uh, no question that in these recurrences, uh, sometimes medical therapy is really very effective. And these are all are used in, a, in our patients with recurrences, particularly the functioning adenomas. So in conclusion, despite advances in surgical technique, recurrences after non rates of non-functioning adenomas after surgery remains high, especially noted if you follow these patients long enough. We looked at the, the risk factors, I won't go through this again, However, there's no question that the, an attempt should be made for a safe maximal gross hole removal when feasible at the first surgery. While the success of second surgery, as you see, is significantly less, 
uh, uh, in terms of gross hole removal, there's no question that reoperation still has a significant role to play in achieving reduction in tumor bulk and decompression of visual pathways in symptomatic patients. While the time of radiation remains a subject of debate, you do it right after the first uh, occurrence when you've got something in the cavernous sinus, there's no question in, in my mind that it is, uh, uh, has a significant role to play in recurrent tumors when gross hole removal is unlikely to be achieved after multiple operations and in tumors showing an aggressive behavior. So the management of giant pituitary adenomas. The incidence is, uh, is in most cases, as you see here from five to 14%, these tumors have increased incidence of uh, neurological endocrine dysfunction. They have capacity for very aggressive local growth and involvement of adjacent structures. Uh, they are surgically challenging. Their curative rates in these, or at least gross hormone rates are rarely above uh, 50%, often less than that. They have increased morbidity and mortality, increased recurrence rates, and overall poor treatment outcomes. And again, the optimal management, if you go in the literature, you don't really get a, a clear of uh, how to deal with these tumors. The treatment options are the same as they are uh, for recurrent tumors. This is a, just a, to show you a 58 year old patient with visual decline that you can see here with this uh, giant adenoma that we'll uh, show you. And again, very, very quickly, here's the tumor, a large tumor up almost to the, uh, the foramen and above. And uh, just to show you, I'm not gonna bore you with this. We always do middle turbinectomies in our pituitaries and particularly in these, we always do a nasal septal flap and particularly in these patients uh, where the CSF uh, leak rates may be um, um, you know, more problematic. Then of course in these, a, a wide, wide, wide sphenoidotomy is the key uh, to these. And uh, then the, this allows you a very nice exposure that you can see here. And then basically the usual techniques uh, of the uh, dural uh, incision and then the multi-layered uh, uh, removal that we do. And this is a diaphragma that has nicely descended. We go laterally to make sure we've uh, removed everything from the medial wall of the cavernous sinuses to ultimately get a very nice uh, removal of this tumor. And of course, here's our nice nasal septal flap that we use for the, uh, for the repair. And this patient, as you can see here, day one post-op, nice uh, removal. And this is now two years out again, looking like stable disease. Significant improvement is uh, in his visual acuity, but as you can see, the visual fields often do not improve as well, particularly if they've been long-standing. This is a 50, oh, this keeps going back. This is a 74 year old patient uh, with this uh, large tumor. Again, very quickly to go through, um, there we are. And uh, sometimes the, the, you can even uh, try to achieve a sub, uh, extra capsule removal, as you can see uh, in this patient. Ultimately, we've got a, a nice removal. There's a diaphragma coming down. And this patient, uh, just to show you uh, post-op, uh, has bleeding. Now, you know, uh, some people are concerned about this. As long as the vision is not a, a concern, do not worry about these because you've got a large space and something has to take its place. So you often see this bleeding, not to worry if the vision is, is stable. We do not, obviously, we don't go back. And you can see here at uh, six months, it's come down very nicely. So this is a, often you see this with a giant adenomas postoperatively. Now, what about this patient? It's a patient with a large tumor into the sphenoid, cella, and anteriorly. Maybe in the past, we would consider doing this uh, uh, open, uh, an open approach. With our extended approaches now endoscopically, this is uh, one of our first endo extended endoscopic approaches. And here we go to just show you, this is, uh, we removed the tumor from the sphenoid down here. Now we're gonna remove the tumor from the cella, uh, showing it here, but after we remove that tumor, we don't, we don't get this component coming down. So this is where we do the transplanter, trans uh, tuberculum approach. And then we'd be treated basically like a, a meningioma that, that uh, maybe uh, uh, Luigi will talk about. And we come above the tumor. And then as we take it down, you can see a beautiful view of the, the chiasm that we are uh, taking it off. And here's this patient post-operative scan. And you can see here, I think he's now eight years uh, uh, out. What about this patient? Very ugly looking tumor, uh, MN1. Uh, with an elevated prolactin, but this is obviously not a prolactinoma alone. It must be a, a, a mix because uh, prolactin should be in the thousands uh, for this large tumor. This patient uh, uh, obviously did not respond uh, with just uh, uh, dopamine agonist. We did a, an expanded endoscopic approach, but look at the residual that, uh, that uh, was left. What do we do now? Well, the issue is do you go, uh, do you observe it? Do you go uh, repeat surgery from above? 
radiation, medical therapy. Well, our feeling was that this patient had significant residual, we're not gonna watch it, and we recommended radiation. He had fractionated stereotype radiation, 50 gray, three years with stable disease. What about this patient? Long-standing visual, virtually, virtually uh, uh, um, uh, blind, you can see finger counting. What is the best approach for this? This patient we did with an endoscopic approach. Uh, as you can see here, this is a residual, significant residual. Uh, look at uh, uh, ischemic changes in the uh, thalamus, likely perforator injury. This patient did very well, very, uh, I mean, very poorly, very bad outcome. Left hemiparesis, hemiparesis, cognitive dysfunction, worsening of vision to bilateral uh, um, finger counting. So was this the right, uh, the, the right approach? Difficult to know. And so this is a problem with uh, giant adenomas. You can get poor results in some patients. The limitation of the transpinal endoscopic approach, large invasive adenomas, lateral extension, multiple compartments, and vascular encasement. So this patient that you can see back in 19, 2003, this is uh, just when we're starting, what was the best approach? Well, I felt that endoscopic approach we're just starting was not a good approach for this. So this one I did basically trans uh, uh, open. I use my, my, my classical approach with the open is an interhemispheric transbasal approach. And you can see this very nicely here. Here's the anterior communicator, the prechismatic, and this appears. So what we do is go through the lamina terminalis, a prechismatic space, allowed us to get a very nice debulking of this tumor. We don't kill ourselves or you get a, a total remove, but here is this patient here very nicely. And now this patient is 15 years and he's remained stable. You, you never understand why this patient remains stable and another patient uh, you know, will recur. So this is our series that we presented back in 2014 now uh, in our group in Toronto. You can see uh, here, uh, the definition of giant and large varies in the literature. What we used was a, a, a volume-based definition we thought might be um, uh, more uh, sensitive. And 10 cc's was our definition for giant. Here's the parameters, the clinical uh, uh, demographics. The outcome, what we really wanted to know was what was the extent of resection that we could do? And then of course, the endocrine changes and the complication rates. So 73 patients, just like, as I said, in the series, it was 12% of our overall series of uh, almost uh, uh, 600 patients. Here's the demographics uh, and 16% uh, had had prior surgery already, 4% had prior radiation. The presentation were generally uh, uh, optic nerve issues that you can see here. And the average size was quite large. You see almost uh, 18, uh, 19 cc's. Uh, Fred, three character. minutes if you could, three okay, minutes. Good. Thank you. This is the characteristics. I won't uh, go into that. They are pure endoscopic. 5% we use in expanded approaches. What are the results? 24% where we felt we got a gross total removal rate, uh, which you might say is pretty low, but that's the reality, I think, and it's an honest uh, uh, issue. Um, now, the issue is that the predict predictors of, re of resection, maximum tumor ever is obvious tumor uh, size, also hemorrhagics. These are always fibrous tumors and were uh, made it more difficult, of course, uh, invasion, uh, particularly in the cavernous sinus. The non-significant, which was a, a bit of a, uh, a surprise to us, was that prior surgery did not seem to, to be a significant parameter or prior radiation, including biological tumor characteristics. I thought, you know, an uh, MIB, et cetera. And this is on the complication, uh, CSF leak was 10%. And I don't, I'm not gonna show you the literature in terms of giant uh, adenoma. This is uh, from uh, uh, the um, Schwartz group showing, uh, they looked at endoscopic versus open, showing a significantly better uh, outcome after endoscopic. This is our own series, that, uh, at least uh, pr uh, guidelines that we, that we looked at, uh, the systemic review, 33%, very similar to our, our, our series. So in conclusion, uh, Jacques, the endoscopic approach uh, can obtain ex a, an extended resection equal or higher than transcranial techniques. Endoscopic approaches are, are safe and more effective in alleviating symptoms in these giant adenomas. Transcranial approaches are still necessary. In our series, uh, about 3%, 2 to 3% still require craniotomy. And no question that radiation therapy has a definite role to play in controlling residual disease. Um, and then just basically that the evaluation and management of patients with recurrent and giant pituitary adenomas requires, I believe, an active participation of an experienced uh, pituitary surgeon, as well as equally experienced multidisciplinary team of endocrinologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and pituitary neuropathologists. So it's really a, a team approach and uh, 
Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, Fred. Thank you. Vast experience. Many, many pearls, many lessons to learn for everybody. And then this was a masterful. Thank you so much. If you could, you stop sharing. Yeah. Great. Luigi, your turn. And again, I cannot thank you enough for your willingness to do this late in the evening in, in Napoli. But we're, we're ready to hear you now. <laughs> and we will forgive you if your voice crackles as you speak. We know it's late. <laughs> thank you so much. It's, uh, as usual, it's a true privilege to stay with you. And uh, in the next minute, I'll share with you the experience of our group from Naples, as you say, guided by uh, Paolo Gappabianco, who is my mentor, my master. And uh, the topics, as you say, concern the endoscopic management of uh, anterior skull base uh, meningioma. This is on uh, a cadaver, the perspective uh, uh, of the midline skull base that you can uh, expose when you pass through the endonasal route. And these are the kind of meningioma that uh, uh, you can approach uh, through the endonasal route. And uh, we will focus our attention mainly on tuberculum uh, cell meningioma, on planum and the olfactory group. But uh, as you can imagine, the rule for petroclival uh, and also on cavernous sinus is uh, quite limited for the endonasal route. This is our series, and uh, through the nose, we manage uh, 79 meningiomas, and the vast majority is represented by tuberculum cell meningioma. And uh, uh, this is a transcranial perspective, as you can see here in this slide, of the amount of bone you have to resect when you deal with the tuberculum uh, uh, cell meningioma. You create a sort of a craniectomy just in front of the pituitary gland and the chiasm and optic nerve. And through this hole, you can uh, approach and remove uh, some selected tuberculum cell meningioma. And it's very important to underline one point. When you deal with the tuberculum cell meningioma, the, the opening you have to do over the skull base surface is much larger as the one you do for craniopharyngioma. You see here, you have to expose uh, on both sides the supraclanoid portion of carotid artery. You have to see the optic nerve uh, entrance into the canalicular part of the canal. And this is very important. That otherwise, you will miss some part of the tumor in this corner, and uh, uh, you will lose uh, the, the benefit you can have when you approach this tumor from below. So this is very important to underline. Of course, the factor affecting the outcome in uh, tuberculum and in German surgery are the same you have to consider when you approach this tumor from above. And uh, the first one, of course, concerns the tumor dimension. And as you can imagine, usually the size of the tumor we approach from below is smaller as compared to the one you approach from above. But of course, we uh, have removed not only small tumor, but also some tumor of medium size like this one or even this larger one. And uh, uh, you see, for example, a case like this one uh, has been operated with a transcranial approach elsewhere, and this is the post-op result. You see just uh, a little bit more than a biopsy with uh, some brain damage. And uh, this patient we have then operated from below, and you see that at the end we were able to remove, and this is the only sign of the uh, previous surgery. Another point to consider, of course, is the optic canal invasion. And regardless to the size, sometimes you can have a large extension of the tumor inside the canalicular part of the optic canal with uh, only a small part of the tumor growing over the tuberculum. And this is important to, uh, to know that uh, if, for example, for a craniopharyngioma, you can uh, open just the tuberculum and the limited part of the planum sphenedalis, uh, with the endoscope, you can uh, um, 
uh, when you have to deal with tubercle meningioma, you can extend much laterally uh, your uh, bone removal, even on the lesser sphenoid wing, even on the roof of the orbit, and sometimes this is necessary. What you do practically is to drill over the supraoptic recess. You have to drill over the lesser sphenoid wing. This because allow you to gain space over the optic prominence of the optic nerve. And in this way, you are able to control the entire course of the optic nerve up to the annulus of Zin. So you can open also the canalicular part of the nerve and you can have a wider view uh, not only on the inferior surface of the optic nerve, but uh, even above. This is uh, one case uh, of a small, quite small uh, tuberculum cell meningioma, but with a wide extension inside the canalicular part of the optic nerve. You see here the ophthalmic artery, but look what happened when you have to deal with this tumor. You have a broad invasion of the dura, not only at the level uh, of the tuberculum, but, but even along the canalicular part of the uh, optic canal. And um, even if you are able to open this, uh, um, this canal, for sure you will never be able to remove uh, completely the dura around 360 degrees around the optic nerve. This because of course, the endoscope is not a magic wound and uh, probably the answer for this uh, kind of a tumor infiltrating so much the canalicular part of the optic nerve is not, uh, is not uh, the knife of the endoscope, but, but maybe in this case we have to find other uh, kind of answer. But of course the main benefit of the endoscope when we deal with this kind of tumor is the fact that uh, we dissect the tumor from the neurovascular structure with, uh, which um, are almost not touched, like in this case, which of course had a good arachnoid plane, but it's just to give you an example of the strategy we, we use. We manipulate the tumor and we almost don't touch the optic nerve or the vessel. And this is uh, very important, maybe not for this minor compression or moderate compression, but it's very important case like this one. When you have a severe damage of the optic nerve with a very bad neurovascular conflict like this one, in case like, for example, people, the patient has just light perception or uh, a very bad visual uh, uh, field defect, uh, with this approach, you can preserve uh, the residual visual function. The extent of removal, of course, uh, it's comparable to the transcranial uh, series. The visual outcome are quite good. And even if we look in the literatures uh, in different series reported by different authors, usually the rate uh, of uh, improvement of the visual function in the endoscopic series is, uh, is uh, almost uh, every time quite good. And uh, we have tried to compare also uh, our result with the larger transcranial uh, series, but of course uh, it's not too, uh, so easy to compare uh, um, endonasal series with the, with the transcranial series. And it's quite obvious because the more complex, the more larger tumor uh, are of course approached transcranially. But uh, at the end, uh, the idea that uh, um, and not only the idea, but uh, what comes from the results is that uh, uh, the outcome on visual function is generally uh, quite good. And um, this is uh, the same what came out from uh, a European sort of consensus we made uh, uh, recently uh, through ENS. Of course, not all the, uh, the tuberculum cell meningioma can be approached from uh, below. You have, of course, to consider uh, uh, some factor, uh, um, like, for example, uh, the sides and the extension, especially 
the paramedian extension of the tumor, uh, the vessel encasement, and uh, of course, other factors. But when uh, you consider vessel encasement, you have to know that we have dealt, even with some limited encasement of uh, uh, vessels, but uh, of course, sometimes uh, I'm not sure that even transcranially uh, you can uh, uh, choose to remove completely tumor uh, in which there are uh, encasement like uh, in this case, for example. Uh, but of course, when there is a complete vessel encasement, you have uh, two proper selected cases. And there are, of course, cases which uh, uh, no way to uh, to say that uh, the right route is the, 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 is the transcranial one. Another point to consider, of course, is the spinal design is configuration because there are a configuration, for example, like this one, when you have a flat tubercum cell like this, in which the endonasal route is favorable, but uh, there are uh, uh, cases in which you have uh, um, is a configuration, small spinal sinus, and this configuration of the tuberculum in which the end nasal root is, of course, more difficult. And you see, when you have a flat tuberculum, you have the chance to work not only below the level of the chiasm, but also you can have a wide view also above the, above the chiasm. Then we can move more anteriorly to the planum, for uh, to treat just uh, pure planum uh, uh, meningioma like uh, this one of course you can remove this uh, tumor from uh, from below but uh, uh, no way to say that when you have a broad attachment of the meningioma over the entire surface of the planum uh, this case of course has to be approached from uh, from above same uh, principle uh, we apply also for olfactory groove meningioma. In this case, honestly, the approach is uh, even more easy because we don't have main neurovascular structure which uh, uh, are surrounding the, uh, our uh, uh, skull base hole uh, because we are working in between the two orbits, the posterior wall of the frontal sinus and the planum sphenoidale. Uh, posteriorly. And uh, of course, uh, the main benefit is uh, like uh, for tuberculum meningioma, you open the dura, you can easily start to debark uh, this tumor like uh, convexity meningioma. And especially if you have uh, a good arachnoid plane, this is also quite uh, a fast procedure. You can easily debark and dissect the tumor from the brain and uh, uh, the picture you have at the end is, of course, uh, of a normal brain, almost not touched. The limits, the limits are usually the half of the orbit, and you need a cortical cuff just uh, behind the uh, posterior wall of the frontal uh, sinus. You can remove even a quite large uh, meningioma like this one. Uh, but the problem, of course, especially in the past, was the reconstruction of this uh, large skull base defect. And the benefit in this uh, tumor, especially when uh, are so large, is the fact that uh, even with this severe brain edema, you almost not touch the, uh, don't touch the brain when you remove this tumor. Uh, of course, we do not operate all the olfactory uh, groove meningioma through the nose. Um, because, for example, uh, there are uh, some olfactory uh, group meningioma in which the patient is not anosmic, and uh, if you go transcranially, you can preserve the olfaction. So the first condition to operate this tumor uh, from below is the fact that the patient has to be anosmic. Um, and another point is that uh, um, it's better if this tumor uh, have some extension inside the nasal cavity. This because uh, going through the nose, you can do a skull base approach, removing in one section completely the endonasal part of the tumor together with the skull base part of the tumor and the intradural part of the tumor. And uh, uh, this uh, almost without touching the brain. So these are the two main conditions we consider when we uh, approach this tumor from, uh, from below. 
last but not least, I would uh, spend some minutes on the reconstruction because this was considered a sort of uh, Achilles heel of this, uh, this uh, approach. And uh, over the here, we have really uh, tried all the technique and uh, materials uh, available over the, the market. And uh, after 20 years, uh, um, the result of uh, all our attempts are um, synthesized in this uh, technique. F3, which is uh, made just of a fat flap and uh, fast mobilization of the patient. So it's quite easy, seems to be quite obvious, but uh, uh, to reach this kind of a reconstruction, it took for us uh, a lot of years. So basically what we do, we simply use the fat like a cork stopper. Of course, fat has been used in transphenoidal surgery since the 70s, but uh, it's important um, to underline the way we use the fat because we don't use the fat uh, intradurally, we don't use the fat uh, into the spin and the sinus, we simply use the fat across the entire skull base defect. Uh, it's really like a cork stopper, like uh, you see here in this, uh, in this picture. And this for us was the best way to seal all the corner of the skull base defect. Uh, so we don't use anymore any multi-layer reconstruction. We don't use gasket seal, no ballooning, no lumbar drainage. We simply don't close anymore the cell. This was for us the big advance. We don't close the cell. We just use one material across the skull base defect. Of course, we cover the fat with the flap, which uh, is a... Uh, Another big advance in skull base reconstruction because, because uh, a low, a fast healing of the, the, um, of the skull base uh, uh, surface. So fat and flap, and uh, we have completely abandoned all the other kind of uh, synthetic resorbable material we have used in the past. And last but not least, uh, also this one, um, was another factor we, we changed the, uh, co um, completely over the year, the flash mobilization of the patient. Because in the past, we were using to take the patient uh, in the bed for three, four days, uh, at the beginning in the supine position, and that was for us a mistake, because uh, we uh, tried to mobilize this patient uh, as a... Um, as, uh, as fast as, as possible. And uh, I would like to conclude with just uh, one case of reconstruction uh, in a tuberculum cell I mean, in Germany. You see quite a large uh, uh, osteodural opening with a regular shape. And we just uh, simply plug a piece of fat across the skull base defect. There's no risk of overpacking uh, with, the, with the fat. Uh, pushed inside this way because the excess of fat will be pushed outside by the intracranial pressure. You can simply try to tilt the table above and below, and you will see how the pressure of the fat over the skull base defect uh, changes. So in all the cases in which we have used the fat in this way, we never, never had any case of overpacking. So uh, we just fix the fat with a thin layer of fibrin glue, and then we cover, uh, as usually, the fat with the nasoceptal flap. And then uh, we fix the flap with the sun surgical uh, to, to fill completely the, the spinal sinus. That's the post-op uh, uh, CT scan. You see how the fat is positioned. It's not inside, not outside. It's just a cross completely from inside to the outside skull base defect. And you see the way how the fat uh, goes around the skull base defect. How to check this patient? We usually use a suppression fat sequences at three months post-op to check eventual remnants of the tumor. And another point you have to consider that over the time, the fat will be resolved. And um, we now uh, 
are going to consider what happens when you have to redo surgery. And we have one experience with the craniopharyngioma to uh, reoperate a patient with this kind of technique uh, after craniopharyngioma surgery. And uh, of course, it is just one case, but the impression is that we have not so much uh, scar uh, and no more scar as we had in the past uh, uh, with, with, other, uh, with other technique. And I think this is the last slide and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luigi. Very nice. And, and you're, you're certainly even within your time limit. Uh, that was excellent. And thank you for reporting the Napoli, the Napoli experience. Um, actually, I'm going to take the liberty to ask you, Luigi, one of the audience questions. Uh, Dr. William Martinez from Lima, Peru is asking, with the COVID pandemic, What's, what is going on with transphenoidal surgery? Can you tell us a little bit, maybe the history of what your yes, institution has yes. done and what you're doing now? There, were, uh, there was a lot of uh, people scared about, uh, about this approach, especially at the beginning of, uh, of COVID. We have a lot of restriction because, of course, uh, that's uh, the way the, the, the virus uh, entered. And... Um, we, in the first stage, stopped completely the endonasal procedure. Then we gradually start again to do with the, with the old uh, maneuvers uh, and testing uh, available. Um, but uh, actually, that is the situation. Okay. All right. So before I pass it on to Corina Levin, I'm going to just share one case to get the opinion of the panel to get us going with the with the discussion because this is a recent case and i thought might be useful to get the opinion of everybody here um, so this is a 54 year old female with bitemporal hemianopsia with this well presumed pituitary adenoma um, uh, uh, Luigi, let me start with you. What, uh, uh, what would you do? Endonasal, uh, transcranial, uh, non-functioning. Non-functioning pituitary adenoma. So yes, it's not an easy case, but uh, I would propose extended endonasal. When you say extended, you mean transtubercular, transplanum, or is that yes. what? Yes. Yes, what we do usually is that we start doing a standard opening of the cell. And if the tumor is soft, uh, because uh, we are lucky that day, and uh, we saw on a T2 sequences that the tumor is soft, maybe you can have the chance to, to remove it through a cellar corridor. But this uh, seems to be a dumbbell shaped tumor, so maybe uh, just a cellar uh, approach would be not enough. So. Uh, we have to be ready to open also the planum and to work also above the, uh, the diaphragm. Okay. Fred, what would you do? You're muted. Fred, you're muted. And, and, and please, panelists, open your microphones. This is now we're going to all talk to each other. So, so I, I think, you know, uh, I would agree with... Um, Luigi, you know, this is someone you say you can do try a transcranial, but to me, this would be a, a case for an, ex, uh, an endoscopic. And then the key is to uh, to open up a little bit of tuberculum and uh, and uh, planum because that allows the things to come down. The problem is if you don't, it's like a you know you have a, a, a narrowing there and the things do not come down. So it's nice to give that opening that allows to go down uh, to come down. So it, uh, definitely an endoscopic approach. Um, Mike Shikoin, transcranial or endonasal? I would agree. I, I would do this uh, endoscopic, endonasal, trans, uh, tubercular, transplanum if need be. Um, you know, as uh, Fred mentioned earlier, sometimes these things don't deliver down. So you'd be prepared to look deep in there. We have the advantage. We use an interoperative MRI in, in these cases, and, and we can see what we might have left behind. It sometimes help us, helps us identify something that's uh, higher up there. But... Uh, Sometimes treacherous, so can't always be certain it's all going to come out, but that would be my, my first attempt. 
Phil, do you agree? Yeah, I would agree in principle. You know, in practice, I can tell you that I haven't done an open gratuity in probably two decades now, and we've done more than a thousand of these endoscopically, but I do not tell everybody that don't consent everybody for an expanded endoscopic and I do not discuss risks of an expanded endoscopic with everyone. So, although I see what Luigi says, I would take what I can. And if not, if I can deliver the top with a lumbar drain or with anything else, I would just let it be and see what happens in two or three months. And I would either go back and do an expanded approach and, uh, and or if it's not that much or it comes down, maybe do it again, just purely endoscopically. Uh, Luigi, which, what features do you look for in an MRI to tell you, oh, this is not good for endonasal and we should do transcranial? Or do you always do endonasal? To, you, would you rather achieve an intentional partial resection endonasally sometime? What's your philosophy with the giant ones? With the giant one, of course, when there is a vessel encasement at the level of uh, um, anterior perforation area, perforating okay. vessel, when, uh, when you see on T2 or flare uh, some invasion uh, around that area, I think that uh, even transcranial approach, uh, you can have problem. So uh, the problem with giant is that sometimes you have to remove as much as possible because if you left uh, too much tumor, you have infarction. So you have always uh, to balance what is the best to remove as much as possible uh, or uh, to leave some remnant and the risk to have uh, a bleeding of the residual tumor. So okay. sometimes maybe as Dr. Law said, uh, the better is not to operate at all this patient, <laughs> especially when they have just a few symptoms from some giant tumor. Okay. One of the audience members is asking who would use an, an ultrasonic aspirator in this type of tumor? No, I, I would not. Uh, Luigi, do, what, do, you, do you use uh, technical you know, ultrasonic aspirator-like instruments? Uh, for pituitary adenoma, very rarely we use ultrasonic aspirator, but for uh, this uh, tumor, which grows so deeply, um, uh, we need a special instrument. For example, the standard uh, suction cannula, for example, uh, for example uh, are not uh, uh, long enough or curved enough especially if you work with the endoscopy, you need at least a 15 centimeter curved suction cannula, because uh, this is uh, what happened to us the first time we tried to go so deep, we had not long uh, um, and especially curved enough cannula to, to reach the deepest part of the tumor. So... Uh, a little bit, it reminds me a little bit of the initial problems we all had doing C1, C2 resection endonasally, you know. Yeah, uh, we need, to, exactly. use the, we need exactly. to use the 17 centimeter drills to get there, yeah. Okay, uh, so this patient was at another institution and the neurosurgeon there decided to do a left craniotomy. According to him, when he called me later, said encountered fibrous, fairly bloody tumor he achieved partial resection. Frozen section is a pituitary adenoma, but the patient woke up blind in the left eye on the side of the craniotomy. Here is an immediate post-craniotomy CT scan. Uh, Dr. Shekoin, so the neurosurgeon calls me and tells me the story, tells, shows me the post-op CT. What, what do we do now? Uh, very concerning. Uh, it doesn't look like a whole lot has been removed, best I can tell from the, the scan. That's right. That's right. Uh, I think still my intention would be to go endonasal endoscopic to try to decompress this as much as possible. But once they start losing vision like that, it could be a treacherous situation. May or may not get it back, but hopefully uh, can potentially recover some vision. W would you treat this as an emergency? Uh, I think would I would, you, would you sit on it to, to let the dust settle? What would you do? No, I, I would probably 
do this as promptly as possible. I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, I don't know, you know, you have to look at all the images and see if there's any obvious hemorrhage into this and, and so forth, but, uh, and hard to know what happened. I mean, was there any evidence of arterial injury? No, he said he just had difficulty because it was fibrous and moderately bloody. It wasn't a bloodbath, but you know, some of these adenomas can be a little bloodier than others. He's, he saw the optic nerve and then realized he cannot remove the whole thing, so he quit. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I guess the other consideration would be you know, to go back through the craniotomy and do an optic canal decompression, clinoidectomy, and, and, uh, and see what you could accomplish that way, but uh, tough case. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would do, in a redo case like this, I would not go endoscopically. I would do it transcranially again, like Mike was just saying. I would just go uh, transcranially and try to decompress and take as much as possible and obtain hemostasis. I think it would be a mess to go from below. Why hemorrhatic. do you say that, Phil? Because of if the... If it's hemorrhagic, I, I can't tell if there's blood here or not, but Smoke if there's no. an acute, it's it's an acute change amount. in your vision. No, no, but well, it's not acute. She woke up like that. I mean, immediately post-op, she woke up blind in the left eye. With there was no hematoma yet. Yeah. I mean, I would probably still go transcranially, but... Okay. Fred? So, uh, I think she's blind because he went in the left. He, you can't, uh, he manipulated the, uh, the optic nerve, and uh, as, you, as you have to do with these, you have to work over it, and that's why she's blind. Uh, uh, it's a, probably a mechanical uh, injury. So, uh, no, I don't think going back in uh, uh, craniotomy-wise is going to be any any benefit unless, you know, in terms of, uh, I would go uh, transsphenoidally uh, with this. I don't think I'd rush in. Uh, there's no, you know, I want to see sometimes that, that vision can improve. This was immediately after. I don't know if she's remained blind, uh, but I would, uh, you know, would uh, not rush back in, but ultimately go back endoscopically. Luigi. Yes, I agree with Fred. I will go and the last. I agree and the last. Carolina, attend. what? Oh, sorry. Carolina, how would this have been handled in NYU where you were more than a year ago, even though now you're in Miami? But uh... um, I think in that situation, you know, if, the, if he's saying that he went in and he had trouble, my guess is, is likely a mechanical injury uh, too especially if you don't see a hematoma that really is compressive causing that blindness. So I think we would uh, actually have gone endoscopically as well. Um, and not, not, not necessarily acutely either. Um, should, right. was, she, was she in a, in the hospital still when he called you? Like, was he? Oh like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she, he was rounding on, I mean, it was, it happened that day. He called me that evening. I said, okay, arrange for an emergency transfer to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so not to belabor the point, sorry. Um, so I, I took, I, tra I treated this as an emergency. I took her for an emergency. I mean, like the minute she hit the, the our hospital, just was like seven or 10 days ago, I did endonasal endoscopic transtubercular approach as a couple of you, I, mean, I don't have the video to show you, but this is, this is how it was pre, pre my surgery. Uh, that's, uh, and then I, I, you know, we removed it completely, of course, with the help of my trusted rhinologist. Uh, this is pre post op, uh, pre uh, post op. Uh, uh, it, you know, was able to bring it down, even though there was this hourglass appearance. Uh, and uh, that's also pre and post op. But the gratifying thing is she immediately improved her vision. She at first, like like waking up from this endonasal, she was count, uh, not counting finger, she was seeing light. By the time we discharged her two days later, she was counting finger at the three or four feet. So I, I certainly do not regret treating it as an emergency. What I found at surgery, I mean, the optic nerve was fine, was not injured mechanically. There's a small amount of surgical blood, but no, it wasn't a hematoma problem. Uh, just just the swelling of the, of the tumor, I think, compressed the left optic nerve. Just to show us the really, I think it's a good example of the benefit of, of doing it from below, of course. I, I don't know if I would have achieved the same good result going transcranially again, 
but uh, do you manage the uh, the fibrous character of it from coming from below? Wasn't you know I wouldn't have called it very fibrous. I'd say it's medium fiber. I mean, it wasn't like this you know uh, well done steak that you can barely move. It was it certainly wasn't suckable, so I had to remove it piecemeal and tug down and get around it, but wasn't the most horrific uh, texture I have seen. So the audience is asking, are there any MI cor correlation with consistency of the tumors uh, in order to be best prepared from the approach standpoint? What do you guys? Okay, any of you would like to answer that question? Can we be, pre can we tell, does MR elastography, do you guys use MR elastography? Do you have other tricks to predict texture of tumors? Any of you? We've, we've, tried, and, and we've tried in the literature has tried, you know, many, and in the end, I don't know if there's a, a very good uh, predictable uh, issue. And that would not, uh, for me, make a decision of whether I would go uh, uh, transcranially or not. So it doesn't make any difference, uh, you know, to me in terms of approach. But predictability, 100%, no, you can't, you can't be sure. Yeah, yeah. But maybe in the future, we, can, we will be able to rely on radiomics. You know, radiomics uh, is, a, is a promising technique and uh, maybe will give us more information because uh, up to now we rely mainly on T2 sequences, which sometimes is useful, of course, not in all cases, but maybe radiomics in the future will, uh, will give more answer. Okay, let me have experience in other field, but the radiomics seems to be with this machine learning, maybe. What do you think? I don't know. I hope so. Yeah, I mean, I again, I, I don't know that it would really change the approach you would choose. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Most cases. Okay, let me invite Corina, Corina Levin to share her screen and show you guys whatever she would like to show you. Okay. So um, you asked me to bring a case. So I have a case. This is kind of a strange case. Um, so I have an unknown skull based tumor. Uh, this is a patient um, who is a 49 year old male who came with a nasal mass. He had red pink discharge on the right um, for a little while prior to arriving. And then just before he had come to see me, he had had this severe epistaxis episode and had gone to an outside ENT who tried to scope him. He had very bad crusting in that area and scabbing from his previous bleed and that blocked the view. And so um, on my physical exam, we saw that all the cranial nerves were intact. This patient's vision was attacked. He had no lymphadenopathy, really no deficits other than saying the right side of his nose felt kind of blocked now since he had the nosebleed and he'd been having this drainage. Um, he did get imaging performed and uh, it showed a sinonasal mass that was eroding through the skull base. And so I'll show you guys a little bit of that imaging. So here are a couple <laughs> slices, um, one from the CT scan where you can obviously see the erosion of the skull base and also one of the axial cuts on the MR just so you can see the extent of uh, this tumor. And um, I'll go through just a very brief video of what we had on our MRI, but you can just see in this coronal plane, the extent of this tumor that extends up really basically from lamina to lamina up into the skull base, and then has some post obstructive component in both the sphenoid and the maxillary. And I've shown you some still visuals here as well. Um, so based off of uh, this imaging, does anybody have an idea of what they think this is? just on the imaging alone? So, so I think the differential here is, uh, uh, you know, usual, uh, he's 54 years of age. This is either gonna be an esthesial or an adeno, uh, an adenocarcinoma. I think those would be the top. I think squame is probably not, not that uh, possible. So I, I would put, um, you know, esthesial and uh, an adeno uh, high on the list. I mean, but you know, differential is very, very, very uh, large going down. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have uh, anything different to add? I mean, a snack may be like this. I just, so it's not biopsied yet, right? They tried it. Not been biopsied yet. Um, so that is the, the next thing that uh, we want to think about. Here we go. So um, 
in endoscopy and clinic, um, it, this is a red purple mass. It's filling the right ethmoid. It's pushing the septum to the other side and it didn't look highly vascular and I had some imaging. Um, so I knew it wasn't brain hanging down and it certainly didn't look like that. So I biopsied it in clinic. And this is what we got for pathology. I did give you guys all the details. A typical epithelial and spindle cell neoplasm, positive for SMA and negative for just about everything else. And it was a good biopsy. In fact, the uh, pathologist commented on it. We had quite a large piece and they still could not figure out what it was. And they had two very good head and neck pathologists take a look at it. Um, so based off of this, does anybody have any guesses on what it might be or want to revise their thought process? So it's very interesting, Karina, you say this because I had a patient very similar to this. Uh, it, it, this was involving the, the lateral skull base in term temporal, where uh, it was uh, the final diagnosis and this was sent not only our head and neck pathologist sent to Boston sent everything, the end of a spindle cell neoplasm at the, uh, you know, despite all of the immunohistochemistry and uh, so forth, I uh, reoperated on the patient to try to get, you know, more um, uh, molecular profiling to see if we could get a, uh, you know, a, uh, a type of a, a targeted therapy. So sometimes, yeah, you, you'll find nothing more than a spindle cell, you know, uh, neoplasm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a schwannoma. Obviously, in terms of spindle cells, what are you know what are spindle cells? You know, they're not really a schwannoma. It could be a near uh, uh, and how do you say uh, hemangiopericytoma, but you said it wasn't that vascular, so that's unlikely. Mm -hmm. That uh, they're very interesting. It was very strange. So they asked me. Um, I talked to them, and they said we need more tissue. Yes. I apologize yeah. because they rarely would ask for more tissue given the level of biopsy I gave them, but they asked for more tissue. So um, we got them more tissue. I took the patient to the OR and uh, we interop sent it down for frozen. They said, well, it's a malignancy, but we just can't tell you what. Um, and so uh, then we went and reviewed this at our head and neck tumor board where they have the pathologist do kind of a second look on finalized pathology. So it got, you know, now a fourth review. It's positive for P63, keratin, uh, A1 and uh, 3, and CK8 and 18. Anybody have an idea what it is now? I don't know what to make of all that alphabet soup of uh, <laughs> immunohistochemistry, but malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, could it be that? Um, no, it was negative for BRAF, and it was uh, cranial pharyngioma. Oh. Uh. And um, the reason that we really discovered there's craniopharyngioma actually happened to be the pathology fellow who had just done a different rotation and said, oh, you know what? This really looks like craniopharyngioma. And then they went back and they had all of the uh, neuro uh, path people look at it. And then they went back to my original biopsy and they concluded that it was craniopharyngioma. So um, we finally had a diagnosis for this patient. And um, then, you know, it's really planning as far as what we would do. So, so if you where, where, where from though? So yeah. originating um, from what? Yeah, so, so it's very interesting. So it doesn't connect in any way with the pituitary. Um, yeah. do you ha Corina, you have an, a sagittal MRI or no to show us? Um, I don't think I have the sagittal on okay. this. I have an axial, but not the sagittal. Um, so there will be one on the video and you so will Corina, see it. it's very, again, amazing. Uh, I had a patient like this about uh, six months ago. Uh, this is a, 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 an ectopic, if you say, craniopharyngioma arising. This one arose from a, another type of tumor. So it, it was, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, sphenoid sinus. And of course, you know, the craniopharyngioma uh, 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 originated from Rathke's pouch, which go from the mouth all the way up. So then this is, uh, uh, you know, it can happen. And they are, they are, they are malignancy. They're doing a, a malignant tumor, which was, uh, which was an, uh, um, which is a malignant craniopharyngioma arising from uh, another type of uh, tumor in the sphenoid. That's very, um, it was very strange. So we, uh, we ended up talking about this patient at a tumor board and then proceeding to um, do our resection. So I'm going to try to move my view of you guys so I can start my, um, my video here and I'll just kind of talk a little bit through what we ended up doing. So you will see uh, some of the imaging here. 
we'll just review a little bit uh, the coronal and also I believe we have the sagittal on here as well. And so here's your sagittal view. His pre-op MRI was not great, but um, at least showed us that it wasn't uh, really extending superiorly and doesn't connect with the pituitary. Yep. yep. So this is a case um, that we started and then you'll see when Dr. Ivan comes in to help us out with doing the resection. So this is uh, the tumor. And of course this tumor has already been biopsied because I had done a pretty extensive biopsy to get them a lot of tissue for diagnosis. So you're looking at us clearing everything and really the ethmoid sphenoid to so start exposing the skull base. And um, as many of you know, the principle when you're doing all of the endoscopic surgery is just to first both debulk so that you can get access, but also get around everything. So you're seeing the septum bulging over and you're seeing the um, inflammation in the maxillary there that we've now cleared out. So once we go through the septum, you can see now that there's tumor on both sides. We wanted to try to preserve as much of our septum as possible that we didn't think was involved, but when we finally did get out all of the septum that was involved with this tumor, it was a very little sliver of septal flap. So we knew that there probably wasn't gonna be a good septal flap at the end. And then here we're just exposing the ethmoid skull base. We're cauterizing our ethmoid arteries um, so that we're preparing ourselves for doing our, our anterior skull base resection. And then the principle um, is really just getting circumferentially around everything. So now we're looking at the anterior portion and soon you'll see that we'll uh, drill through and do a full low thrust in the front so that we can get connection between our frontal sinuses You can see going all the way back to the sphenoid. And now we really have this floating tumor and we're just gonna debulk it a little bit before we start trying to open up the skull base. And then we'll start drilling down some of that bone so we can get through and expose our dura and then resect our tumor as much kind of block from the skull base as possible. Even if it's not a, you know, a classic tumor, I usually like to try to take that piece as one as opposed to lots of little pieces. So you can see the exposure of the dura here. But Corina, had it gone through the dura? It um, was attached on the dura. So this is uh, Dr. Ivan's team coming in here and making um, some of our cuts so that we could really release the portion of the dura that was attached and uh, everything else obviously we left in place, but it did uh, really adhere to the dura for a small portion of the tumor. And you can see that it didn't end up being as large of a skull base resection. This is kind of like a mini skull base resection, but we did take out all of the dura that was um, intimately attached to this tumor. And so you were able to get clear margins? Yep, I did actually treat this the same way I would treat a squamous cell or anything else. I did um, margins on everything. So before we even got to this, I had gone through margins, including taking down the lamina where it had eroded through on one side. So here we're just taking out the falk so we, that we get um, a really nice area to repair and then putting in a little bit of surgicil. We do our repair differently. Uh, we often do our repair with allodermes. This is allodermes being spread out. We do an inlay, onlay. So I'm tucking all of the alloderm underneath uh, the edges of the bone. And then I'm using gel foam wrapped in Surgisil in little strips to basically tuck in the, um, the cavity so that it sits up underneath the, the bone between the brain um, and the bone of the nasal cavity. And once you fill that area, then it really does um, hold everything in place. And you're seeing us just kind of doing that whole process of the repair. And then we really lay everything out. We'll do a Valsalva, making sure that it's nice and uh, watertight. And then for this area, we'll cover everything with gel foam and put in packing, which is what you're gonna see. You see Luigi in Miami, all the patients are very svelte. Nobody has any fat on them. So we can't yeah. find any fat anywhere. <laughs> nice they all want to put in their butt. Nice um, so this is, uh, you know, kind of a, how we do a lot of our repairs. And this is how we did this patient's repair. This is his post-op imaging. And you can see that we have the alloderm repair here, then the packing that's there, and that we didn't see any signs of residual tumor. And then this is just the four month post-op. I saw him recently. He's doing very well. We did not end up doing radiation because his, um, Mirak was negative, he's back to work, he's doing his regular activities, and he looks pretty good. We're pretty happy with uh, the resection and repair, and we'll keep following him with imaging. 
but uh, this was certainly a strange case and he is a, a unique individual to begin with. So um, uh, I think it's kind of a, a unique case to take a look at. So Karina, we should, uh, we should uh, publish this. So I have one up in Toronto, it's exactly like this and yours. Have you, have you, have you looked into the literature? Because I had my fellows look into the literature yeah, of uh, malignant uh, craniofringiomas in the paranasal sinuses and uh, very, very few in, in uh, reports. We, um, we actually sent uh, genetics um, and it came back consistent just to make sure that we did have yeah. um, what we expected. And, uh, and so we're writing up the case report, but I think it would be really interesting because there really isn't anything in the no. literature. Um, luckily, this patient is very excited to be unique and he is excited to be the center of a, a publication about him. Corina, you should join forces with uh, Fred Gentili, maybe report them together. It'll yeah. be more interesting. It will be a series. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great, thank you, great case. Mike Shekoin, let me invite you to share your slides, please. You're muted, Mike. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Great, can you see my slides there? Yes, indeed. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cranial pharyngioma here. Let's see, it's not advancing here. There we go. First off, thanks to Jacques and the, and the team there at University of Miami. These Zoom posiums have been great as we all hunker down during uh, this COVID thing, uh, getting a chance to meet up with our colleagues and, and uh, continue neurosurgery. Here's Jacques uh, welcoming our Nigerian guests at the NESBS in uh, 2017. Uh, I tried to find a picture of Jacques uh, screaming down the street in his Tesla, but uh, I think he was moving too fast. <laughs> I have a lot of those. I'll show them later. <laughs> good, good. I think the uh, Miami Dade County Police have some of those too, but I, that's another story. But uh, but thanks again. These are these are great. Um, for some reason, give me uh, trouble. Hover over your slides. Yeah. There we go. Um, so here's the case. This is a 39 uh, year old gentleman with a supracellular lesion, some headaches, some blurred vision, some mild endocrinopathy, some polyuria, polydipsia. And uh, in this lesion here, uh, you can see it on the T2, it's bowing up his chiasm, contributing to his visual field deficit. Uh, CT, not a lot of calcium on it. Um, and uh, here's his visual field, uh, somewhat of a bitemporal hemianopsia. So lots of choices. So in life, just as in surgery, there, there are choices, there's options. Uh, we have the Trump Biden choices, uh, you know, some choices are good, some choices are bad, and, and surgery the same, we have choices. So uh, maybe just a quick pull of the uh, panel there. In the, uh, so for this tumor, as you see in the upper left and right, transcranial approaches, endoscopic endonasal approaches, uh, um, maybe a show of hands or votes there. So to me, uh, definitely endoscopic approach. Luigi, endoscopic? Yes. Yes, and an answer. Me, yeah, I, I agree. Me too. Phil? Yeah, me as well. Okay. All right. So we, we agreed. We did an endoscopic approach. I, I won't ask you who you voted for in the lower left part of the slide there. But, um, so here is the, here's the uh, video of that. And I'll try to skip along through some of it here. Uh, sake of time here. Did this with Patrick Pipcorn, one of my uh, ENT colleagues here. So the initial... Uh, approach here, drilling off some of the tuberculum and planum region there. I'll skip forward, opening up some of the, the uh, dura in that region. Uh, starting to see the lesion here, coagulating some of the uh, intercavernous sinus. So you can see the optic chiasm distorted superiorly there, kind of coagulating and shrinking the tumor some. And uh, it was unfortunately rather adherent to the uh, to the nerves and chiasm. Made it a little bit more challenging to deliver this one. Uh, it shrink uh, to some degree with the uh, bipolar coagulation. Has that sort of typical character of a cranial. See pretty uh, pretty adherent there. Um, and coming into view here, um, we see the pituitary stalk kind of stretched. And so that question of, you know, do you try to save the stalk or you just amputate the stalk? He did have somewhat preserved pituitary function, not 100%. So wisely or not, I tried to preserve his stalk. Uh, anatomically, it seemed intact. 
Um, and ultimately it seemed like we got the large majority of it out, but there was some of it really stuck to the undersurface of the, uh, the chiasm. And then we closed up here. We happen to use this, uh, in this case, a bi-layer buttonhole alloderm uh, technique, um, also with some fat. Uh, I liked uh, Luigi's description of the, the cork stopper. Uh, so a combination then a, a nasal septal flap. Um, and uh, he did uh, okay after that. His vision initially, immediately after surgery was worsened. Uh, so concerning, we did this immediate MRI. Uh, fortunately, shortly after that, his, his vision uh, got much better, but kind of as I was concerned about, there was a little residual tumor there. Um, you know, so what to do now to, to radiate that or not? Um, um, so, uh, but you know, in, when we saw him in a few weeks uh, later after surgery, he was doing well. He did have hypopituitarism worse than before. So saving the stalk may not have uh, been any great advantage. Uh, a little bit of residual tumor there, as I mentioned, and uh, this was a craniopharyngioma papillary type, uh, unlike the one that was just recently described uh, earlier. Um, and it did have the BRAF B600 uh, mutation. Uh, so a little time goes by and, and he didn't pursue any treatment and, and unfortunately it's coming back. And uh, so, you know, you can see the cyst enlarging, a little bit of worsening of his vision. Uh, and so now what? Uh, maybe I can pull the, you know, the, uh, the panel there and see would you, uh, what would you now? Um, a little bit bigger tumor. Would you go endonasal again? Would you do a craniotomy, uh, eyebrow? Would you radiate, and if you'd radiate, uh, what technique would you use, or or how else might you treat that one? So, Michael, uh, uh, interesting case. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not uncommon uh, story with these uh, cranial. You know, talk about recurrent pituitaries. Uh, the recurrent cranial is very, very common. So, to me, I've had this happen very often. And what I do here is, uh, it depends on vision. If his vision is getting significantly worse, he needs another operation to decompress his optic and then get on with radiation, uh, uh, you know, right away. If he hasn't, vision isn't that significantly compromised, I would proceed with radiation now. This is not a good uh, case for uh, gamma knife, obviously, because the optic, I would do uh, IMRT, uh, you know, fractionated uh, uh, radiation. And some people would say, well, look, and it's cystic and it doesn't, you know, radiation doesn't help. That's not true. Uh, re, you know, cystic components can, in fact, uh, um, you know, respond to the radiation. I've seen them, you know, collapse down very, uh, very, very quickly. So that would be my, my, uh, my recommendation based now on what his vision is like. You know, you, you can't, if his vision is going rapidly, you have no choice but to go back in and decompress his uh, optic apparatus. You're not going to get a, a, any uh, a total removal absolutely the second time around in cranials. Uh, you know, that's going to be impossible. I agree with uh, Fred 100%. And I have seen this, especially the first 10 years of my practice when I would not radiate them. And uh, I have even seen patients who are radiated and the cyst continues to be there. And eventually the day of surgery MRI showing that the cyst comes down and you don't go in, kind of cancel surgery the day off. But, you know, it, what opened my eyes was about almost 10 years ago, Mike McDermott and I wrote an article, a, a review article on craniopharyngiomas and recurrence. And I went through the entire literature from malice to now. And the truth is that gross total resection of craniopharyngiomas is associated with up to 50% reoccurrence. That's what we call gross total resection. And that radiotherapy for craniopharyngiomas, even up front or at the later or remnants, is almost 100% control at the 10 year, anywhere, usually above 95%. So that's the data. Now, I've heard this argued so many times, and I'm not exactly sure what data people are looking. But I think really, I do not think there is much of an indication to not radiate somebody post-op, especially somebody who is already hypopit. But I agree with, with Fred, I wouldn't go in now. I would just radiate it. If his vision is okay, I would yeah, just That's my point. I, but, you know, but if his vision is going down, you know, and I've had those who've come in, the patient, you know, they, it says she's now severely, you know, you have no choice. You have to go back in, but only to decompress her you know, her optic apparatus, that cyst, and then get her on to radiation right away. And would you do it from above, Brad? No, no, no. From below? 
from from below. So his vision actually wasn't too bad, maybe maybe a hair worse, but you know, for the most part, he was fine. It was nowhere near as bad as it was when we started. And uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it had this BRAF mutation, and our our, yeah. our oncologists were a little fascinated by that. So he got started on a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor. And this was uh, uh, the fall. Uh, this is a couple months later, maybe a little bit of shrinkage. Um, and, uh, and then some six, eight months later, drastic reduction in the size of the, of the lesion in response to these BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Yeah. And, uh, and so you see his vision at that point is, is doing fine. And uh, so at this point now, we did treat him with radiation, but now our target was much smaller. These, I'm sorry, these images uh, from the gamma knife don't show up all that well, but you can see it's a pretty small target and the, uh, the amount of radiation you know, to his chiasm and, and uh, optic nerves was much less. We did this with our icon device in a hypofractionated technique uh, using a mask with uh, five doses rather than a, a single dose. And um, here he is now, you know, three years or so out from the initial and has little if any tumor left. And, and uh, so something to think about, you know, uh, here's, here's just the series of it uh, initially. Here's uh, early post-op uh, and that early recurrence and then response to the MEK inhibitors and, and now, and then same scenario in the, in the coronal. So a couple of things. So, so here's, you know, some of the data from UCSF from some years prior, but, uh, you know, talking about how, he'll, uh, how Phil had mentioned, you know, the, uh, the, the radiation with a subtotal resection is, is, uh, is quite effective, you know, maybe as effective as a, you know, so-called gross total resection. And then this whole idea of the BRAF inhibitors, uh, so, you know, as the Boston group identified that the vast majority of these uh, papillary cranial pharyngiomas, 95% or more of them have this BRAF mutation. The adamantinomatous tend to have the beta catenin mutations. Uh, and they had this early uh, case report from, from the group there in Boston showing uh, a dramatic response of, of one of these tumors. Um, and an interesting thing in that paper, shrink to what you showed and secondly 
would you consider using it neoadjuvantly for a you know unresectable or really tough looking you know big tumor that you know it's a craniopharyngioma just to make it more manageable? For yeah, sure. it's an interesting concept. I mean, again, it only works in the papillary uh, variation, not in the adamantinoma. So you know, at least probably need a biopsy uh, to confirm you have a BRAF a mutation. But it's an interesting concept. Maybe in the future, uh, you know, we'll see what comes out of this alliance trial that's ongoing uh, to see what the role of it may be. But um, how you long know, did you treat it for? To, to uh, he ultimately had, I think, about ten months of of the drug mm -hmm. or the two drugs. Um, and you know, generally, it was very well tolerated. Yeah. But, yeah, very important case. Thank you for sharing it with us and, and the audience, so they're aware of uh, of that. Wonderful work that started with Priscilla and Fred Barker up in up in Boston. Um, um, Phil, take us home. Show us what uh, you have. Hold on. Uh, here we go. All right. So I had to take a lot of the pictures that I was going to share with you because. I was told they were inappropriate. It was mostly Jack. And I, uh, late night, late off, night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just a uh, plug-in for neurosurgery. Now we have a whole uh, section for skull base, and please submit of the Red Journal, and please submit. We're looking for good basic science and serious kind of uh, research papers for skull base to advance it into the world of uh, modern science. Um, in a couple of cases, I'm going to start with this one. It's it's um, the second one is a very recent one. This one's a little bit back, but I think it 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 talks about a different pathology that we haven't talked about much yet. But it's a 55 year old woman with two months of trouble with her vision and multiple cran cranial neuropathies, progressive headaches, and she presents with this. So, um, thoughts from the panelists. When you say, when you say cranial neuropathy, I'm sorry. Which ones? Three, three four, six, or three, four, five, three, four, five, and six. Five is partial. It's mostly ophthalmoplegic, but not completely. Unilateral. On the right. Right. And, and no so, endocrinopathy? No. So, Phil, this is a, a you know, interesting, uh, uh, challenging lesion. I, I think in terms of the differential, I mean, you know, it, uh, um, I get the impression from the axial, I mean, he's got an intracranial component, right? Oh, yeah, even on the sagittal, you can On the sagittal, that. you see it, you know, I guess you're going up, but not, a, not as much as the axial on the sagittal. In any case, yeah. this could be, I think, uh, the, anything from a, um, you know, chordoma, chondrosarcoma, very uh, unlikely, but there it could be a paranasal sinus uh, uh, lesion, could be a lymphoma, um, difficult... Uh, it's too yeah. it's too nicely rounded for a lymphoma, Fred. I think. Yeah, I think it's been, that's very down on the on 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 the list. Can, can I uh, ask? He, he met at least a cavernous uh, angi angioma. Schwannoma. <laughs> Schwannoma. Oh, yes, yes, very much so. Yeah. Schwannoma. Uh, can I uh, before I tell you my opinion, Corina? Looking at the. T1 and T2, if you think of paranasal sinus tumors, what, which ones come to mind? Do you, any come to mind uh, with the, uh, this appearance? Ignoring the fact that it's through the clivers onto the brainstem. If you had seen this yeah. more anteriorly, what would you have thought of? Um, I mean, I think that it, it probably depends a little bit. It, it, it certainly, um, you know, it's not... Uh, real bright on T2. So you're not really thinking of something that, um, you know, is kind of your classic, you know, so this type of expansion we'll see in some of even the benign sinus uh, tumors. But, you know, sometimes I just think of um, really extensive adenomas. 
we've had some very oh. extensive adenomas um, that have really extended out. Oh yeah, they're <laughs> great mimickers, absolutely. And um, and because of where it's based, it really is so posterior. It's not really in the anterior portion of the skull base. Um, it would be high on my list of things to be thinking about. Um, we've definitely had you know huge sinonasal components with erosion of bone and that look like other things. Um, so at least when I look at this, that, that's something that I'm kind of thinking about just by location. And then obviously the, um, the erosion through the clivus makes you think of other things. You know, Phil, it, it, it's not quite well like the ones I've seen, but I don't know if somebody mentioned it, but cavernous sinus hemangioma. Yeah, yeah that's this, what I mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely have this. You, you can take a pencil, as you know, and draw it around. And they have that typical spilling into the cellar. I don't, I don't have a coronal to see if it does it, but I, the ones I've seen, I haven't seen one that's digging into the brainstem like this that far yeah. posteriorly, yeah. but... Uh, Anyways, it comes to mind. So Bill said this was something we, we hadn't talked about yet. So how about adenoid cystic? Sure. My first thought was a making tubular or something, but <laughs> then I thought maybe we should biopsy this and we biopsy it and it's chondrosarc. Yeah. Uh. High grade chondrosarc. So <clears throat> what the uh, what would you guys and gals think about, how would you approach this other than the making tubular? Let, let's ask Luigi first. Luigi, what do you do in your center? Staged approach or yes, staged, what do you do? Staged, staged, and the nasal uh, and, uh, and then transcranial approach, yes. And you would start with the endonasal? Yes, it's a, it's a chondrosarcoma. I think you, you can go first in the NAS. You can go, no problem at all. Uh, Fred? So I'm not sure if I missed something here. Do we have a diagnosis? Chondrosarcoma. Oh, I see, biopsy of chondrosarcoma. High grade. High grade chondrosarcoma. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's difficult. Uh, you can do a combined approach. Uh, I would probably, like uh, Luigi, go initially. It's it's easier, simpler to deal with the the uh, endonasal component and see what you can do. But I'm not sure that's going to help. You know, the intracranial component. Mike Shacoin. Yeah, I would go anteriorly first. I mean, uh, you know, endonasal at least in part. But I might. Uh, with my ENT colleagues, think of something more expanded. You know, maybe a uh, Caldwell Luck transpterygoid approach to to expand this and get a little broader access. You, you might be able to get quite a bit of out of the middle fossa. You know, these chondrosarcs are often kind of soft, and you know, looking with angled scopes and things, you you might get a lot of this out. And it's presumably a, a large majority of it is extra dural. It's going to shell off the dura nicely there. So I would definitely start anteriorly. Uh, Phil, you're not showing us a coronal, but I assume yeah. obviously the carotid is completely. I mean, the cavernous sinus is exploded. No, so I, 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 I don't. I can't use the pointer here, but the carotid. You see that little dot? It's in the middle of the tumor, kind of a centimeter off the middle there, and it's okay. basically the tumor has gone around the carotid and goes out in the middle fossa. The carotid has not been displaced. It's kind of in the middle there, where it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, I personally would do the reverse of what uh, uh, the guy said. I would, I have the, maybe a year ago, I had a chordoma, a little more midline, uh, but very similar, almost reaching the fourth ventricle. It was splitting the brainstem, and I was worried about the basilar perforators. So I actually went transcavernous, transcranial first, cleared everything intracranially. Uh, and, and I'm glad I did because I wouldn't have been able to handle the perforators that well endonasally. And then the part that was clival and into the sphenoid was very easy to then do stage two endonasal and then to deal with any CSF leak in the stage two. That's how I did it. And I think that's- So where did you stop? Where did, where did you stop anterior? Just at the clivus. I mean, you know, after you, I did that- kind of where the clivus, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't want to right. create the CSF leak from the transcranial operation. Yeah, I was going to yeah. create it in the second stage. 
Well, I thought I should go. I, I agree with most of you. I should do it endoscopically and I and see what happens and potentially go as a second procedure later. And we got in and, and I was able to pull all of the tumor out of the brain, can throw the basilar. So in fact, this with an angle scope, the seventh nerve, which was next to the IAC. So we had a big hole. And once I did all of that, I decompressed completely the brainstem. I decided to try to get out laterally. And a lot of the tumor, like Mike was saying, was coming. And this is the only thing for time purposes. And after I got a lot of that tumor out, I kept on having this arterial bleeding. Now, mind you, next to my sucker here is the, where the carotid is, which eventually I controlled the bleeding, but after quite a while. Now I had gone out quite a bit with curettes behind the carotid, but I was concerned enough that we, we packed it, it stopped bleeding. We took it to the angio suite. We found out that, you, again, I don't have a pointer here. I'm not sure why, but the little thing here up front in the, in the carotid, as it goes straight up here, it's going straight up because the tumor had basically straightened it out. And, that little thing medial to it is extra basation. So basically I evolved a perforator off of the carotid itself. So they mm. sacked that carotid. Now, this is the immediate post-op scan. So basically the only thing that's left as far as tumor is concerned is that stuff that was so far lateral, but you can see now where the carotid is. And you can see I was centimeters out from there. And as I was pulling stuff gently, knowing that I'm around the carotid, I pulled something. Um, you were too greedy. That's what happened. Yeah. You were no, too no, greedy. That's right. That's right. And actually, you know, listening to you say what you would have done, although I don't necessarily mind what I did, I think it wouldn't have been a bad idea to go all intracranial because I think I would have done the same job that way. But, um, you know, I was lucky that I she didn't leave that carotid and she didn't turn a, anything. And she actually became... Her cranial neuropathy has improved significantly, and then I radiated her. And this is yep. the scan now. So I was itching and thinking of going in transcranially, but then I realized, and this is three years post radiation, that I'm not so sure that the combined thing would have added anything to this. A second, you know, cranny would have added anything to this. But I started thinking, like most of you did, that. The combined thing would be the needed thing, and I, I proved myself wrong, I guess, in both ways. But, but I mean, Phil, I, I hate to say, it, but it's only three years, and it's a chondrosarcoma, isn't this? Yeah, residual, I mean, yeah. I mean, I agree, I agree. Yeah, but I don't see, I mean, I don't see tumor per se. I mean, maybe in the bone, yeah, but I don't see intracranial tumor, and I, so yeah. I, I, I think it's an excellent result, Phil. We have to see the long-term thing, but. And that's the advantage of the endoscopic approach. I don't know if you would have got, you know, the, the cranial nerve um, uh, improvement, you know, with uh, with an open approach. True. So, so that's I think a very good result. True, but I will also say that were I to cause a big bad stroke from taking the carotid, I would have thought exactly like uh, Jacques was saying. I should have done this all transcranial, and, and if I need to, you know, if there was something in the clavus I couldn't reach, I would have, you know. Hindsight is always an issue, you know, but uh, <laughs> exactly. it's not, it doesn't work that way. Exactly right. Did you have? Did you encounter any CSF, or was it all extradural? No, no, no. It was through the through and through the dura into the posterior fossa. It was a big hole, and in, in basically there was no dura there. No. The middle fossa stuff was all intradural, so there was dura as best as I could tell, and and we never, for example, got subarachnoid blood from this. Um, but no, we were clear into the PIA, I mean, not into it, but next to the PIA of the brainstem. It was in the posterior fossa, it was all intradural. Excellent. Very nice, yes. very nice. Yeah. So this is open mic. Anybody wants to ask questions, challenge somebody else? Uh, actually, yeah, do you remind me something? Uh, uh, oh, oh, you have another one? Oh, I have another one, but I don't have to show it. I mean, we can uh, open the mic. Yeah, I just we just have five more minutes. I think I'd better finish it up with, yeah, yeah, with yeah. questions. No, um, um, 
I, Luigi, you, you quoted in your presentation that EA, EANS, ESBS uh, consensus statement about uh, meningiomas of the anterior skull base. Uh, I actually used that paper recently to kind of give the counter argument because I, I'm, we're not going to get into it today, but I don't, I, I don't like endonasal for even simple endonasal, I mean, anterior skull base meningioma. But in that consensus statement, it said transcranial remains the gold standard, no? Or am I misreading what's in the paper? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, well, well, so let me, let me, for, uh, sir. That for um, that there are some advantages in selected case on visual function for uh, tuberculum cell meningioma. But yeah. they agree it's different as what happened for craniopharyngioma. Yes, it's completely yeah. different. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jacques, no, sorry, Jacques. Jacques, the, the, this is the EANS one. I don't think I've seen one. As you know, there's a yeah, one out of Pittsburgh that is a, a consensus statement for for uh, endoscopic skull base surgery that uh, was started there. And uh, the, the results were similar, you know, uh, and I did one for olfactory groove that suggested that in fact, um, you know, the open approach is really the, still the approach of choice. Correct. There's, there's located, you know, particularly in, in Osmia now that we know, in Osmia is a very important function. So, you know, you cannot spare olfaction using endoscopic. You can, not always, with an open approach. So, so very rare in, indications for olfactory groove meningiomas. But yeah, Luigi, is... Luigi, question though. I mean, last time I was with Paolo, he was telling me that he does not do endoscopic stuff for tuberculum meningiomas anymore. Because I said the exact same thing to him that I had. I like the transcranial approach too much to not do it now, but no, do no, you no, guys still do. do it or what 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 do you say practically? What would Absolutely. You say? We are doing it and we are doing more tuberculum than our factory group. We are doing more tuberculum than our factory group. And uh, but uh, as I said, the problem uh, for meningioma was the CSF leak rate because uh, it was uh, some way uh, accepted for craniopharyngioma, high rate of post flick, because all the problem related to transcranial approach for craniopharyngioma surgery, but was not acceptable for meningioma because the result for meningioma, the transcranial result for meningioma uh, were and are good. So when you have to compare the two routes, you have to give at least the same results. And for meningioma, was not so good at the beginning. But once you have solved the problem of leakage, which uh, was the main problem, I think that at the end, with the proper indication, you can do this surgery. Also on a tuberculum cell meningioma. Because I think that uh, among the anterior skull base meningioma, the tuberculum or diaphragma are the more uh, difficult. I, I don't know if you agree, but uh, uh, even a not so large tuberculum cell meningioma can give you some problem. Yeah. So the endonasal root with the proper opening uh, uh, can give good result. One, you have solved the, the problem of CSF leak. This is the reason why we are pushing so much this technique of uh, 3F. My own, my own approach has been, and I, you know, I've, I've presented papers on this, that selection is the key. And the issue is what, what you know, and it, people have different selection. I must say in my own practice over the last uh, year, uh, you know, I've done, you know, much, much more open uh, because my selection is very critical. You know, any lateral extension that, you know, uh, you're not gonna get a, a, a dural, you know, a margin on, on that from an endoscopic approach. And so it's the issue is that there is an indication. There's people who say I never do it, I don't think that's right, but it's a careful, careful patient selection. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. The key is the selection. I think the most difficult case for transcranial root can be the, not the easiest uh, case for endonasal root, but some way when you have a deep cella with the flat tuberculum, uh, is uh, is uh, quite easy to remove this tumor uh, from below. 
that's all. Of course, what the cases we treat usually are not those with the vessel encasement, with the uh, paracellar extension, a strictly midline tumor. Um, so in this case, you can do. It's true, but also, I mean, you, you have to confess that we have to place almost a warning uh, label because there are many, you know, people in neurosurgeons, in Absolutely. community hospitals that go in and they forgot the benefit. We still, I think most of us still believe in the benefit of a, Sims, a low Simpson grade result. I mean, after all, and, and then, you know, they go in and I, I have several cases kind of ref referred from elsewhere. People even blinded endonasally after subtotal resection from just inappropriate, you know, not people of your caliber or Fred or others, but, you know, that's what the reality totally can be agree. when they, yeah. I totally yeah. agree because this is the right message. Yeah. You know, we had uh, a lot of improvement uh, and advance uh, with the craniopharyngioma, but when we speak on meningioma, we have to be very careful and honest. I absolutely agree with you. Excellent. Okay. If there are no f final remarks, questions from anybody, I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed this session. I'm sure the audience did, and people will come back and listen to the recorded session. Luigi, uh, the first prize goes to you for staying up so late. What time is it Bravo. now? What time is it? Two? One o'clock. One yes, o'clock. One o'clock. Yeah. It's, it's an early night in Napoli. Come on. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Corina and everybody else. To be with you. Bye bye, right, everybody. Guys. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Great to see you all. Great job, Zach. Everybody stay, stay safe. Very Thanks, well Bye. 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 Bye.